Hi, my name is Michael Goodfriend, and I'm the executive producer of the Play On Podcasts. Listening to a, a podcast series like Coriolanus or Macbeth or any of Shakespeare's great histories and tragedies and, well, pretty much anything he wrote, it's not unusual to hear a lot of things that ring true to our time. Within the first few minutes of the first episode of Coriolanus, it's, it's almost like hearing a splice of today's news. But what was happening in Shakespeare's time when he was writing these plays? What might he have been seeing and experiencing that made him want to tell these stories the way he did? More to the point, when it comes to Coriolanus and Anthony and Cleopatra and Julius Caesar and others, what was it about ancient Rome that made Shakespeare want to set so many of his greatest plays there and then? Well, with me now are two people who I know will shed a lot of light on these timely and timeless questions. Amrita Ramanan served as the dramaturg for our Play On podcast series, Coriolanus. She's a multidisciplinary artistic leader who holds the values of anti-racism, anti-colonialism, equity, access, diversity, and inclusion at the core of her practice. She's currently the senior cultural strategist and dramaturg for Play on Shakespeare. In her five seasons as director of literary development and dramaturgy at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Amrita holistically supported new play commissioning and development for the festival. She served as the production dramaturg for OSF's productions like Cambodian Rock Band, Snow in Midsummer, Oklahoma, As You Like It, Macbeth, Alice in Wonderland, Henry V, Henry IV Parts 1 and 2. She produced and curated the Black Swan Lab for new play development and created the first ever OSF Writers Group. Also, I have with me Julie Foe. She was the voice and text coach for the Coriolanus series. She is a Connecticut and New York-based voice and dialect coach. She holds an MFA in voice and speech from the American Repertory Theater's Institute for Advanced Theater Training. With over 10 years of professional experience, she's coached productions for Marvel, Tectonic Theater Project, Bedlam, Woolly Mammoth Theater, McCarter Theater, just to name a few. It just so happens that she also studied Latin in middle school, high school, and college, and she minored in classical civilization, art, and architecture and focused specifically on the status of women as representative of the city-state of Rome. So I think I have the perfect people here to help us parse through what was going on for Shakespeare and what was going on in ancient Rome that makes these stories, and this play in particular, Coriolanus, so relevant to our time. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Amrita, and thank you, Julie. Amrita, I'm gonna start with you. Yes. Lots of people ask this question, and we asked Kate Wisniewski in our interview with her. I want to hear it from you. Tell us what the role of a dramaturg is in the creative process. Yes. You know I love this question, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Start uh, with the hard stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I, I've had the honor and privilege of being a practicing dramaturg for about 16 years now. And to me, the role of a dramaturg is an individual who can come into a production and support the play's development from inception through to fruition. Uh, I also believe that the role of a dramaturg is to provide a cultural context to the world of a production. Often when I'm working with Shakespeare, so much of my my uh, job is to support how do we understand the translation of a play from when Shakespeare wrote it, from the intended time period of that play, to how an audience is experiencing it today. Uh, and then also, I will say, both in the world of Shakespeare and also when I'm working with playwrights who are developing new and original plays, I work very closely on the translation and editing and shaping of the script. So with uh, living playwrights, I have the honor of supporting their dreams and intentions being manifested through a script uh, with a script such as Sean San Jose's translation of Coriolanus. I 
had the opportunity to work closely with Sean and director Kate Wisniewski on the edit and the cut of the script for the podcast. Uh, and I really do feel with that, the play's the thing. The script to me is always the foundation of dramaturgy. And then I build my work from there. Thank you so much. That encapsulates things beautifully for us. Julie, tell us what your role is as a voice and text coach. What do you do with the actors? How do you help them prepare? And how do you prepare as well? Thing. Thanks for having me today, Michael. Um, so my, my role as voice and text coach uh, has some variety in it as well. Um, uh, as preparation, it involves you know, close readings of the script, um, investigations of the language, any vocabulary that might be um, not as familiar to a contemporary English speaking audience, and also uh, the structure of the language. So much of Shakespeare's work is written in poetry, in iambic pentameter, so there's a structure to that. Um, and some of it is written in prose without a particular rhythm or meter to it. So identifying that, identifying um, figures of speech, the way that uh, Shakespeare used language, certain rhetorical forms, which he um, inherited from writers in the ancient world, from ancient Rome and Greece, um, and sound devices like repetition of certain consonant or vowel sounds. So I'm, I'm looking for that in the text before I even get to rehearsal. And then in rehearsal, I, I work with the actors on um, how to use their voices in a healthy and expressive way and, and and also how to use that language in an effective way that will serve the play, serve uh, the director's vision, and, and hopefully make it as intelligible uh, to the audience, a contemporary speaking English audience as possible. Julia, describe what you learned when you researched women in ancient Rome. So the, the project that I, the research that I did as a student um, around this uh, really uh, investigated how the, the role of a woman in a household, um, how that woman was functioning, how secure that woman was, was directly related in the minds of you know, the folks, the men who were in power in, in ancient Rome, how that uh, directly reflected this, the status of the, the city-state itself. So in particular, it, it, in relationship to our play, to Coriolanus, one of the most famous instances of this is the rape of Lucretia, which happened just a, maybe, you know, a couple decades possibly before um, Coriolanus was purported to be alive, before this play was you know, supposed to be happening in ancient Rome, that um, a, a, an outsider came into the household of, of, uh, of Lucretia and was able to um, uh, sexually assault her. And so that man, uh, Tarquinius, was then expelled from Rome. And that sort of that uh, was happening at the same time that Rome was becoming a republic, that the kings of Rome, that a, a, a system that put one man in control and power was being um, it was being broken down and being changed. And so that's just one example of how uh, the Romans sort of viewed the security of women in the home as being representative of uh, the whole city state. Who was Lucretia? She was the wife of a nobleman, a Roman nobleman, Lucius Tarquinius Col Colatinus. Um, and she was raped by Sextus Tarquinius. Um, so she's the wife of a nobleman, a, a nobleman in Rome, um, but she's also the subject of one of Shakespeare's epic poems. <laughs> so right. there's that that really that uh, connection as well. And then the the epic poem is called the the rape of Lucretia, right? Of so Lucrece, yeah. I'm sorry, of Lucrece. So so this event, this event actually had a lot to do with how Rome ended up being governed in the aftermath of it. Or, it, 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 it was it was happening at the same time. Yeah, I would say it was part of that impetus to expel the kings of Rome and to establish um, a government that had checks and balances of some sort that had distribution of power over um, among more people. The man who sexually assaulted her, um, Sextus Tarquinius, 
uh, was actually an Etruscan. So he was an outsider. He was not a citizen of Rome, which was uh, uh, which is a key part of this um, story as well. Um, that it was able, someone from outside of the city state, a potential enemy was able to literally come into, right, to penetrate a household in Rome and, and take advantage of, of a noble woman in her own home. And, and so Rome, the city state of Rome reacted to this and, and, and took steps to protect households, to protect women. Yes, and, and to protect the whole city state uh, from potential invaders. This is interesting. Okay, so because my limited understanding of the context of Coriolanus, Amrtha, is, is that the play takes place right at around this exact time, right? When when kings were being expelled or or there was fight, they were there was war against the Tarquin kings. Am I right? That's absolutely right. Yes. So I think I think this is such an interesting link. And thank you, Julie. There's so much I learned in what you said, because Coriolanus itself, uh, the play does start a little bit later than Plutarch's biography of Coriolanus. So Shakespeare made a choice to actually start the narrative a bit later during uh, a moment when Roman citizens were easily stirred to rebellion, which uh, we can talk a little bit more about the parallels between that and what Shakespeare was engaging with in his society. But the, there absolutely was an a quality that Shakespeare was holding about how the narrative of Coriolanus is within this moment of true political change change and, and chaos. Um, the rebellion with the Tarquins, the uh, formation of the Roman Republic, um, a, a top-down government that was being established uh, that was looking at the management of, uh, uh, of citizens through a number of different uh, forms of disparity. Uh, so there, there is absolutely a really interesting connection with time in this particular moment that I would argue also I think really paralleled how Shakespeare was looking at this transition from Elizabethan to Jacobian England and looking at the shift there. At Shakespeare's time, in Shakespeare's time, when when he wrote Coriolanus, there was political chaos or there, there was upheaval happening. Can Absolutely. you describe that a little bit more? Yes, yes. Well, what what I will start by saying, there was quite a bit of societal change and chaos. And uh, I remember in 2020, there were so many articles that were uh, shared amongst uh, many artistic, uh, you know, circuits that said that King Lear is the play that Shakespeare wrote during the plague and in trying to inspire artists to write plays like that. Because well, coronavirus all, was raging and, and so... Exactly. Exactly, uh, exactly. You, somebody yeah. was going to come up with the next King Lear. With the next Lear, <laughs> exactly, which I, I think is very unfair to, to playwrights. Playwrights need to also be able to be driven by their own desire and also take care of themselves when there is, you know, a plague affecting our society. But I'm here to say that is actually not a, not a fact. Uh, King Lear predated the bubonic plague in, in England, and Coriolanus is actually the play that was written during the plague, uh, oh. believed to have been written in 16. Um, and this was uh, slightly after the plague created a number of closures around uh, England. You know, it's said to be in late July of 1607 is really when we started to experience the bubonic plague very fulsomely. And at that time, we were dealing with many different conditions um, in, in Shakespeare's world. Um, there were major agrarian revolts that were happening, uh, where there was an attempt of um, what James Shapiro calls agrarian capitalism in Shakespeare's day. And this attempt also within um, the uh, politicians of the time to try to manage um, the the citizens through different forms of taxation, different forms of uh, withholding food, withholding supplies, 
So we're starting to see the way in which top-down government is really attempting to control the population. Um, we also are dealing with the end of Queen Elizabeth's reign, even though that certainly happened years before, but into kind of a fuller Jacobian society. Um, so there is a transition of leadership that we are also dealing with, the transition of a very new leader who is attempting to engage with uh, society in, in, a, in a time of true chaos and crisis. So and, this this yeah. this opening of the, the the first episode where the 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 people are clamoring for food mm -hmm. would have rung very very true to Shakespeare's audience at the time they just experienced this themselves before we go any further let me talk you all really are ready to just die before starving to death First, you all know Caius Martius is the chief enemy of the people. Let's kill him! I thought Shakespeare as a dramatist uh, had a very pointed and intentional desire in that scene because in, a, in the original Plutarch, uh, which, you know, Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Grecians and Romans, which was known to be one of Shakespeare's major sources for Coriolanus, um, the Romans were weighed down by heavy interest rates, and that is actually what's spoken to around the rebellion. Shakespeare made the nature of the grievance towards starving citizens in need of food supplies. Uh, and that is where the fable of the belly speech, which Meninius has, came into play. That was completely Shakespeare's creation. And I believe that Shakespeare was speaking specifically to the agrarian revolt and what he was seeing in his society. So agrarian capitalism, can you describe that? Uh, what is what is Shapiro, James Shapiro, by the way, the scholar who wrote the book 1599, right? That's right. And, yes. And Year uh, of Lear and many, many others. Yes. Right. So what what was agrarian capitalism? Yeah, so what Shapiro was speaking to and what uh, I've also, I've, I've researched this, I've been very curious about this because I always love to learn more about the context of a play, how it was created, is um, at the time, uh, this had happened just, um, you know, a year before Shakespeare likely wrote Coriolanus, uh, there were thousands of laborers who were experiencing closure of common pastures, of pastures where laborers used to be able to have more freedom to to grow and to manage their own crops by wealthy landowners and that and apparently during this time the landowners were able to receive support from uh, the authority at the time to be able to then crush these revolts that the laborers were having so we're essentially dealing with uh, uh, individuals who who before had a bit more openness in terms of their uh, use of the the land, their ability to grow crops, and now it's being contained by, you know, so to speak, the one percent. And anyone who would protest would essentially be um, be killed or be uh, heavily oppressed. Um, so I, I I think we can see the parallels of today as well. I mean, there's so much about the wealth disparity that Shakespeare was really looking at in that form of agrarian revolt that really speaks to what we're currently dealing with and what we just dealt with last year. Uh, Julie, I want to go back to something that we were talking about early on in this conversation and, and just ask you, from what you know, and, and based on what you're saying, were women treated better than they had been historically in ancient Rome? Not really. <laughs> um, <laughs> they... <laughs> You know, um, it, it depends on what women you're, you know, you're looking at. But you know, the the women, the 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 wives of the patricians, of the senators, of the you know, the sort of upper upper class were um, mostly. I, I'll go as far to say ornamental. You know, they were um, they were meant to be. Uh, looked at and and seen as being wealthy and taken care of and you know they had um servants right people in the house that would do work for them but they were really sort of arm candy <laughs> so, and, so protection um, of women was protection of property yeah yeah 
it had nothing to do with actually respecting women. No. Um, yeah, they were repre- they were representatives of. Yeah, I, like you said, property as well as the city state. And then if we're looking at the women who were the in the plebeian class, they were, you know, also relegated to the home, but were so um, overworked with taking care of children, with taking care of the farms, when the men were away fighting in the wars for the city state. So they were, you know, they were not, not given the rights that men were, uh, they were not, you know, able to participate as citizens in, in the everyday life in Rome. So no, they were not treated better, I would say. What drew you to that particular subject, to women as representative of the city-state of Rome when you were doing your studies? It was, it was one particular art history lesson that I was in. Um, I took a whole course on women in ancient Rome and how they were depicted in, in statuary. And um, we got to a, a lesson that was focusing on depictions of women with looms. And so that's where this came, uh, my professor. Looms, uh, as in uh, like is, weaving looms? As in weaving. Uh-huh. So this was a this is a common theme in, in how women are depicted in Roman, ancient Roman statuary, and they're usually in the agora, which is the central part of the traditional Ro- ancient Roman house, you know, of the of the of the upper class. Um, so the house was in a sort of rectangle sh- or square shape with an opening to the outside in the middle, and the rooms were around the periphery of the home, and so there are many. Um, uh, depictions of women in that agora, that outside shape in the middle of the home, sitting at a loom, weaving. And this was, um, you know, for the society in ancient Rome, a, a sign that that household is happy, is prosperous, is secure, that the woman could be in the outdoor space in the center of the traditional home, um, making something, right, providing clothing or, um, you know, something that will give warmth, that will give protection to bodily protection to the members of her household. What drew you to ancient Rome and ancient Roman art and architecture in the first place? I had a wonderful Latin teacher in middle school who was uh, very inspiring and uh, inspired a love of the language and the culture in me. So because of her teachings, I continued to study Latin from seventh grade through college. And um, when I got to college, I thought that maybe I would uh, study some art history to satisfy some re- general education requirements. And I ended up taking uh, an art history survey course with this professor that I was just describing, who, you know, I later took the Women in Ancient Rome class from, and she was similarly inspiring to me. And so she, um, because of her work uh, and her work as a teacher, she I sort of went that way with my with my classic studies into art and architecture. So you you studied Latin from seventh grade all the way up through through college. Yeah, through my sophomore year of college. You have that in common with one William Shakespeare. Right? Yes. <laughs> is, is, yes. Am I, uh, Amrita, is it right? Uh, am I accurate that, that Shakespeare was forced to study Latin? Yes. Yes, he was absolutely from a from an early age, probably much earlier than actually when Julie started, um, and 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 also you know so interesting to think that in today's day, you know, Shakespeare is often part of uh, core curriculum standards in uh, the majority of public schools. And if there were any core curriculum standards that did exist in Shakespeare's time, it would have been Roman literature. That that is really the equivalent. So it's easy to imagine William Shakespeare having to study Latin, having to study ancient Rome and going, huh, there's a lot about what I'm learning here being forced to learn that has to do with what I'm seeing out in the streets. Yes. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I think in the way that we uh, quite consistently when uh, walking with Shakespeare's work today are approaching the parallels of Shakespeare's time to our time, I think Shakespeare was doing the exact same thing uh, between Roman society and Elizabethan and Jacobian England. Did these plays like Coriolanus, were they, did, was he commissioned to write them? Do you think he just happened upon them and decided to write them? Do we know? It's it's so interesting, Michael, because it is truly a variety. You know, we, we do have some uh, we do have some records that show that Shakespeare was commissioned, and, and we are familiar with with the patronage that his his company received. Uh, there are some plays that are very much theorized to have been uh, an invention of his own. Uh, I will say with Coriolanus, it, it is quite an interesting one because at the time when he wrote wrote it, uh, similar to what we have just experienced in our society and what we're coming out of, uh, the plague had resulted in major closures across uh, across England, uh, including the city's public playhouses. Travel um, bans? Like Say people were allowed time, to travel travel bands, people were uh, travel to... bands, and you know, and it's said that the Globe Theater was um, from you know July of 1607, likely closed for the next 30 months. You know, it was a uh, really you know really extensive, and uh, and I think with all of that, you know, given when Shakespeare wrote this play. I my my guess I will I will own that it's a guess is that this was not a commission play that this was truly a play that came from a time that so many writers are dealing with right now where they there was not active performance uh, there was there was not as much work happening and Shakespeare was able to sit with himself and consider how can my art be a reflection of the time that I'm experiencing. Was he taking any kind of personal risk in telling this story, do you think? I, I absolutely think he was. I, I think, you know, it is, I often think that it's highly risky and, and courageous for writers to uh, speak to the oppressive, oppressive and systemic structures that exist in their times. And given that Shakespeare had and and would continue to receive so much patronage from uh, those in authority. Uh, I think a play that so brilliantly speaks to the oppression of that authority to the common people is absolutely a risk. And I just think it's so fascinating to see how intentional Shakespeare was, how even with Coriolanus, Coriolanus is not painted as the hero of the story. He he comes in in the first scene and he mocks the starving citizens and and talks about how desperate people should pray as opposed to demanding relief. They'll sit round the fire and act like they know what's done in the capital, who is to rise, who thrives and who declines, take sides and give out projected alliances, making parties strong and weakening those not standing their way beneath their beaten shoes. They say there's full grain. <laughs> If the nobility would drop their pity and let me use my sword, I'd make a quarry with thousands of these quartered dogs as high as I could pitch my spear. I think that that resonance, uh, was, which I think speaks to Shakespeare as a populist, I think Shakespeare with this play, uh, I hope, was able to speak to the marginalized voices of his society, but absolutely took a risk with those who did own uh, land, did carry wealth, and did often support him in those means. Does Coriolanus relate to any of the politicians or the military leaders of Shakespeare's time, to your knowledge? I... Uh, I, you know, it's interesting. Shakespeare, I have not found anything in my research where there are theories about specifically who Coriolanus could refer to in Shakespeare's time. I I would guess that it is more of a composite. I think that Shakespeare altogether was looking at, at leadership uh, and looking at the complexities of leadership and looking at the, the challenges of leadership and 
finding in Coriolanus a character that I think has such a, a broad arc and so much contrast and looking at, you know, wealthy landowners and shareholders, looking at King James, looking at, uh, you know, looking at, I think, so many different individuals and trying to form, you know, what what happens when leadership is engaging with power and systems of power? Julie, can you tell us about the historical figure of Coriolanus and the people that might have been in his milieu at that time in ancient Rome? Yeah, a, a, a little bit. You know, he's um, so he was part of a, a group of uh, in, in that a group of men in a, that time in ancient Rome who were. Um, in charge of the wars that were started once the Republic was um, uh, was established. And so they were leading um, armies that contained some of the police, some of the plebeians in them um, out um, and, and def- sometimes on the defense, sometimes on the offense in the neighboring city states. Um, he, you know, the little bit of history that I've read about his, his life you know, he was said, it was said that his father died at a very, when he was very young. So he did grow up, grow up just with his mother. And um, sometimes that relationship came into question about how, how devoted he was to his mother. And, and sometimes he was um, criticized for being so um, sort of at her beck and call or so, you know, so um, deferential to her as a woman, you know, some of the history I know about him also supports the, his feelings as they're expressed in the play about the plebes, about the common people that he was, um, you know, in his interaction with them in the army was not a fan, (laughs) you know, wanted nothing to do with them. Um, And, you know, as far as I know, he was, you know, he was part of this group of military military leaders that we were being recruited into government because the government was changing the system of government and that they didn't have experience with that. They had experience in the field, um, in war and, and sort of, and so then interacting in, uh, with other people in a more diplomatic way was uh, new to them and not always appealing. So, up on, or at around this time, there was a shift happening from being led entirely by what we would call military leaders to a more representative form of government. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, in our play, in Coriolanus, we see some of the first tribunes that have come from the plebes. Um, I'm That's glad I see you nodding. <laughs> Brutus and um, Sicinius, right? Brutus, a word. Was there ever a man so bold as Martius? Truly, Sicinius, he has no equal. When we were choosing tribunes for the people? You noted his lip and eyes? No, just his taunts. Angered, he will even scoff at the gods. (laughs) Mock the modest moon. These wars devour him. He's been so valiant it's grown his pride too great. Such a being, tickled with good success, scorns the shadow he treads on at noon. But... I do wonder, can his insolence endure the command of Cominius? So this is the first time that we get a kind of House of Commons um, represented in government alongside with, um, you know, people in government, men who have come from more higher classes and from more wealth. Julie, I want to talk about language with you for a moment, if, if I may. What... Is it about Latin that helps you understand Shakespeare? Is that a fair question? Yeah, I love that question. Um, I'm my mind is going in sort of two directions right now, so I'll take one at a time. Um, One direction is the fact that English is a is a patois as as a language as it's developed over time that it's drawn. or derived from uh, from Latin and also from some Germanic languages and also from some um, Anglo-Saxon languages. So there's a lot of a lot of our 
words. A lot of our vocabulary in contemporary English derive directly from Latin. And um, often when we've got two words for something, um, for instance, uh, father figure versus patriarch, the sort of um, the word that's less in everyday conversation, um, patriarch comes from Latin and the word that's more sort of familiar everyday colloquial conversation comes from one of those other language, language groups. Um, so that's one way that it helps me understand Shakespeare because I can sometimes see through the etymology, you know, to the etymology of, of the, the words that uh, Shakespeare was working with. Um, and also some of the words that he was inventing <laughs> as, as he was writing, because as you mentioned, Michael, he did, he, he was forced to study Latin. So when he was coming up with new words, um, he was drawing on that background. The other stream of thought that I'm having right now is, um, as I mentioned before, a lot of the rhetorical devices, um, the, the way that specific way that Shakespeare structures language comes from his study of ancient Roman orators like Cicero. Um, so when he's using um, even something as familiar maybe to our audience as antithesis that's coming directly from those ancient Roman orators, as well as some other things, some other um, uh, rhetorical forms like synecdoche that uh, some folks might uh, recognize. What is that, synecdoche? <laughs> ah, you're testing me again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only asking because so I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> it is... Uh, not only a town in New York, um, but it is a, a rhetorical device uh, that takes it, a, a part of something. So let's say a hand or an arm to stand in for the whole thing. So we might say a hand and arm instead of a whole person. So is is the belly speech that Meninius gives a, an example of synecdoche? It is. It's also a metaphor, right? Comparing right. one thing to another without the use of like or as. But yes, I think absolutely it would overlap with some activity. There was a time when all the body's parts rebelled against the belly, then accused it. And just like a gut, it remained the body's idle and inactive, always hoarding the food, never giving effort like the rest, while other organs all did see, hear, devise, instruct, walk, feel, and participating all together, they gave care to the appetite and all shared affection for the whole body. The belly answered. Well then, what did the belly answer? True is it, my incorporate friends, he said, that it's I receiving all the food first, which you all live on, and right it is so, because I am the storehouse and the shop of the whole body. But if you do remember, I send it through the rivers of your blood, even to the court, the heart, to the seat of the brain, and through the channels and roads of man, the strongest nerves and smaller low veins that receive their full supply all through me, all they live by, and to you all at once. You, my friends, all this the belly says. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Tell us, if you will, what it was like for you. I imagine you're, you're obviously a lover of language, right? And you're a lover of theater. You're a lover of, of probably Shakespeare. But were there elements of this that were hard for you to swallow? Yes. I remember in our first read through, hearing the language out loud of Sean's, uh, Sean Jose, San Jose's modern English translation, hearing the language in the first scene aloud about, uh, you know, of the citizens, um, the call to storm the Capitol, that was really hard for me to hear out loud. Surprisingly different from reading it on my own, in my own imagination, but hearing that language after witnessing the insurrection on January 2nd was really, really hard. <laughs> Um, female and non-binary voices body, you know, speaking some misogynistic language was also difficult for me. 
I imagine it was difficult for the actors as well. He killed my cousin Marcus! He killed my father! Peace now! No outrage! Peace! Kill! 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 And the just the yeah some of the attitudes as expressed by Coriolanus toward the the plebes toward the common people was also hard to get behind. So here we are, the one year anniversary after the insurrection of the Capitol, which many people called a mob. Julie, can you tell us about that word mob? That comes from ancient Rome. It's a Latin term, mobile vulgus. Vulgus meaning the common people, mobile meaning changing. And it's that, it's the contraction of that to just mob um, that happened about 50 years after Shakespeare died. That's the first time the word mob has been marked or noted. That was super interesting to me. Amrita, what was it like for you to dig into this story with the recent past as a reference point? Um, I, I feel incredibly grateful for the genius that is Sean San Jose. Uh, I, I think that to what Julie spoke to, Sean brought in a modern verse translation that allowed so much of our recent past, you know, I would say between 2020 and now, to be able to pop and come to life through this play. And I think with any play, we always have to ask ourselves, why this play now? What is relevant about it? And Sean brought the relevancy to me, uh, which was altogether challenging and cathartic. You know, it was in the way in which I think art can also provide a catharsis for what we're dealing with in society and show a mirror to uh, the challenges that we may not have been able to fully express. I found Cor this translation of Coriolanus to allow me to have a deeper understanding and a point of catharsis around the recent events. But but it it, it absolutely it's it's so surreal how connective these the the elements of Coriolanus are to what we just recently experienced with the Trump administration in particular. Uh, you know, there, there's so much language within the play, further emphasized by Sean's translation, that speaks to the gratitude of leadership and how any form of criticism of leadership is seen as uh, as a threat. That is very much the language and context that we see in Coriolanus. And literally, there are quotes from you know Donald Trump that absolutely speak to that. Uh, there's references around the hoarding of supplies and food by the state um, when the people are arguing that this is actually for us, that very much felt like the distribution and hoarding of supplies that occurred state by state during the pandemic. And then we do get to the insurrection on the Capitol and we do get to uh, the the way in which uh, uh a government that is attempting to provide support is then being attacked. And so I think that, you know, all of this speaks to what I believe Coriolanus is ultimately trying to speak to, which is the dangers posed by unchecked authoritarianism. And I think that that, that to me uh, was altogether deeply meaningful in going on this journey with Coriolanus and also presented um, some some painful truths about about where where Shakespeare was contemplating about Roman society, what Shakespeare's society it was and where we are today. Julie, is catharsis a Latin word, Latin based? Do you know? It is Greek based. Ah. <laughs> Yeah. What do you know what the actual meaning of that word is? It comes from the Greek word catharsis, meaning cleanse or um, pure. And I think it can be very, even though it's, it, it's, it's very complex in the wording, I think it can be very cleansing when deep truths are revealed in a way that 
inspire and instigate thought and conversation. And I, I remember with Coriolanus, I was part of a workshop uh, at the University of San Diego with an incredible group of MFA students uh, that Sean was also involved with and director Tabi Magar. And the conversations that we had during that workshop, I could tell that the resonances were absolutely grounded in each of the students' experiences and that we were also using the play as a form of dialogue uh, that we've we'd suppressed for the last you know year and a half and and that was very meaningful. Julie, can you talk about the line structures in Coriolanus and in Shakespeare and how you in your interest in language, help you kind of navigate thoughts? Shakespeare wrote mostly in iambic pentameter. So we have you know, lines of poetry that are typically 10 syllables long. Um, pentameter is, there's five feet and I am has two sil- syllables to it. So that's how we get to 10 syllables. And so um, often in Shakespeare's earlier plays, often, not always, the the sort of the thought structure matched up with the verse structure. So we might get um, a full sentence in one line of poetry in those 10 syllables, or at least a place, a a part of a sentence, part of a thought that um, had, let's say, punctuation, like a comma or something, something that um, sort of closed the the, that part of the thought with the closing of the verse line. Um, Coriolanus is, is, we know it, is one of the last plays that Shakespeare wrote. And he was um, experimenting more with the relationship between thought structure and verse structure in those later plays. And so often in Shakespeare's Coriolanus, the, the verse line does not match up with the thought and the thoughts keep going or there are new thoughts in the middle of the verse line. Um, And so being able to um, identify where the thoughts take corner turns is is really vital (laughs) for actors who are embodying this language um, and for me. So being able to identify where there are parentheticals or where the speaker might um, have a slightly new idea Let me see if I can demonstrate. So tomorrow I'm going to the store. Oh, I need to remember to get gas because I need more groceries. (laughs) So there might be those moments of self-interruption that, you know, spill over the end of the first line that go over into the next line of poetry. And so being able to identify that thought process and and where the main line of the thought is, where those little detours are, is is really important for the communication. And and is there more of that happening in Coriolanus than in the previous plays? Is that what you're saying? That that in particular in Shakespeare's Mm -hmm. later plays, he was really experimenting, playing around with those thought processes? Yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, in his earlier plays, like I said, the, 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 thought structure lined up more with the the poetry. And then when we get to, especially what are known as the romance plays, uh, this group of plays that he wrote toward the end of his life, like Coriolanus, Pericles, Winter's Tale, um, The Tempest, Cymbeline. Um, He's really like sort of playing jazz with it. He's using more regularities in the iambic pentameter, not always sticking to those 10 syllables per line. Um, And he's also um, creating longer, more complicated thoughts with a thought on a thought on a thought. Mm -hmm. Almost, you know, the way the way that we actually think, right? One thing leads to another to another. Yeah. Yeah, I could say that. Now, what came first for you, your love of Latin or your love of theater? Theater. Theater was your first love. Yeah. Did you know you were, did, did you want to be an actor? I did. Yes. <laughs> and were you an actor? Are you an actor? I, I was. I, I'm no longer an actor. Um, I was an actor up until a few years after I was out of college and then I, I realized that 
I, I, this is a moment I remember very specifically too. I was watching your reading of a, a playwright friend's play and I realized that I got more joy from thinking about and working on the whole world of a play rather than thinking on, about and working on one character's track of the play. So voice and speech training was part of my, my favorite part of my actor training. And in my thinking, it, it joins a lot of the different aspects of performance. Um, it, you know, it's sort of at the nexus of playwriting as well as acting and, 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 and even being able to understand what's happening in terms of breath and language can be helpful to directors. And so that's, that's when I decided to focus my energy on, on training more in, in the world of voice and speech and text. So voice and speech and text, do you feel like it is the synthesis for you of the love of theater and the love of language, the love of Latin? Yeah, yeah. And did you find working on Sean's translation that the structure remained, the structure that Shakespeare had written? Yes, it, remarkably so. <laughs> um, when looking at the two, you know, two versions of the play side by side, it was really easy to see how much, I mean, Sean did a brilliant job, I think, of that, of, of taking that thought structure within the first structure and, um, and, and changing the vocabulary to a more contemporary English vocabulary. So following the thought and all of the, the sort of the, the original language in a sense remains even through translation. Absolutely. Yeah. Amrita, do you think, is there a relationship here in, in terms of, so Shakespeare was taking, as you said, Plutarch, right. And, and repurposing it. Is that in a, in a sense, another form of translation? Absolutely. I, I do believe that Shakespeare was, a translator. Uh, he often looked at the sources of Plutarch, of Thomas North. Uh, I would say almost every play that engaged with a historical context, uh, there was uh, there were often uh, multiple sources, at least uh, two, sometimes three sources that Shakespeare was engaging with and then translating story, translating language. Uh, so absolutely, he was he was was very much in the process of translation. So when he was writing, he was taking stories that existed hundreds of years ago, repurposing them, translating them, adapting them for his time to speak to truth to power in a sense. Absolutely. And I would say, especially within what is classified as the history plays, uh, you know, the, the plays that often dealt with with English history or, or Roman history, um, although arguably, you know, he did use sources for for Mackers and and Hamlet. You know, he definitely was looking at Scottish history and Danish history. Um, but yes, you know, he was he was absolutely uh, considering the original source, uh, considering uh, the context in which the story had originally been documented in, in whatever way, and then uh, creating a dramatic translation from there. Is, is there a distinct shift in Shakespeare's plays from Elizabeth, Elizabethan England to Jacobian England? And, and can you describe that if there is? Absolutely. I... I, I want to affirm what Julie said. I think I think the shift also runs in the space when Shakespeare was aging as a playwright, so to speak, and becoming more exper experimental. So I, I believe what I've really tracked is that during Elizabethan England, uh, there there were far more comedies that were being written. Uh, there were far more plays that also engaged specifically with English history. So the creation of uh, the Henrys was very much in Elizabethan England. Uh, and then once we get to 
Jacobian, uh, you know, there, there's uh, such interesting stories about Macbeth being very specifically created <laughs> for King James to honor his history, to essentially shift uh, shift the lineage and speak to that. And and then I would I would say that Shakespeare did move absolutely into this world where so many of his plays, from Coriolanus to The Tempest, Pericles, Cymbeline, Winter's Tale, became highly experimental, highly experimental, experimental in language, in form. Uh, you know, Coriolanus is his second longest play, uh, only under Hamlet. And so he was really experimenting with like length and style. And uh, I would say also with, with uh, a really constructive criticism of, of society and politics. Uh, you know, I think I think in even the romances, I think that there's such interesting criticisms about the leadership that one can look at in each of those plays and and particularly the the ask for forgiveness that we see in those plays, which I would say the early seeds actually start in Coriolanus. I think Shakespeare uh, approached a really interesting turn as a dramatist to have Coriolanus uh, switch sides uh, during this play to to ask for forgiveness uh and and i think that we start to see how that narrative uh that narrative structure and that theme starts to follow him in in jacobian in his jacobian writing time as opposed to his elizabethan writing time so you said that that macbeth was to honor jacob's legacy his lineage Yes, King James. Yes, uh, I'm sorry, very much King, King James. Yes. Oh no, all good. Very much. Um, yes, there, there's, there's some really interesting, interesting theories about how that play was written to uh, specifically pay homage to the new king and his Scottish ancestry, while also happening at such a, a turbulent political time that Shakespeare was also looking at that play as a means to speak to the gunpowder plot, to speak to um, the dangers of authoritarian and political regime. Uh, he was he was very uh, he was a very smart playwright that Shakespeare because I think he managed to create plays that all together could appease his patron while what, what also was having. The, uh, sorry, what was the gunpowder plot? Just just fill us in. Yes, yes. So short summary. Oh gosh, how much time do we have? <laughs> but essentially, Guy Fox, sixteen oh five. Um, this plot believed to to kill the king. Um, where uh, gunpowder barrels were were stored essentially under um, under the kingdom at the seat of the king, and uh, how essentially that plot then um, speaks to um, conspiracy and the way in which you know conspiracy operates. Uh, and, you know, it, it really was an assassination plot in, in, in its whole that then kind of, you know, has all these other seeds and intersections that have been dramatized as well about, you know, what 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 were people fighting for? And is was this a worthy fight? And what did King James deserve to have the seat and the crown? And so with that, I think Shakespeare was really providing analysis. I think there was always a lot of subtext, a lot of uh, reflection and introspection in the work that allowed it to live in this duality of being highly popular by the patrons, while also, I think, speaking to uh, these other uh, elements of society that still resonate for us today. Can you can you hear or feel in the work that Shakespeare was doing if he preferred King James to Queen Elizabeth or vice versa? Um, I, I can't, honestly. And and I think so much of why I can't is I think Shakespeare as a dramatist was also responding to uh, what it meant to you know, move through many years, what it meant to gain experience, what it meant to engage with so many different parts and elements of society. Uh, and I think the play is so beautifully evolved as a result of that. And I don't mean an evolution in terms of they got better. I mean that there was change. I think there was shift and change. And I, I, I think that that shift and change was very organic to how Shakespeare was responding to changing society. Julie, as somebody who loves language and, and theater and Shakespeare and Latin, 
are you concerned about what kids in particular are are inheriting now with uh, devices and and Twitter and things like that, or do you do you feel like this is just another phase of our evolution linguistically? I, I think I feel more the latter that language is always evolving. It, it, it never stops changing. And 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 Amrita, I'll echo you. That's not that it gets any better or worse. It's just shift and change. <laughs> so I, I I I don't worry too much about the kids. Uh, I try to keep learning with them about the innovations that they're making with language so that I can continue to participate <laughs> in, in um, public dialogue and, and, and cre the creation of art, um, the creation of art that they will make as they, uh, as they come of age. I still, you know, I, 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 I love Shakespeare's language. I love Sean San Jose's language. I, I'm just curious about all the different ways that we can use it to, to communicate and to reflect our experience, our human experience. Are there commonalities for you when you work with actors, whether they're students or professionals, barriers that you feel you always kind of have to break through in order to reach a place of truth with actors mm -hmm. with, who are interpreting text? And if so, how do you do that? I think any time an actor meets language that's being used in a way that's different from how they use it in their everyday their li day life, there's a little, there's a shift that happens or maybe a barrier there. Um, and so part of the process is um, learning how that character thinks, you know, and how that thought process ref is reflected in the language so that the actor can, can step into that thought process so that they're not just reciting, and, you know, or just speaking the language, but they're really following the thought process that the character is going through. And so there are a lot of different ways that strategies that we can use um, in rehearsal, in class to to bridge that gap, um, I find that um, paraphrasing is useful. So taking the language and having the actor reword it in their own words, their own language is really useful in terms of getting to the real truth of what's being communicated and letting them have the experience, letting the actor have the experience of expressing it in the way that they might say it in their everyday life. I find that um, going back to sort of the thought structure of, of how the language is written um, and taking it piece by piece, allowing breath to happen wherever there's a new piece, a new image, a new impulse in the language, allowing breath to drop in um, at those moments, at least as an exercise is useful for that as well. In our everyday lives, when we're speaking our thoughts spontaneously, we as humans tend to allow a new breath in whenever we have a new impulse or a new thought, a new image. And so letting the body have that experience um, that the speaker would have and the first time they spoke the language could be useful in terms of getting the actor to feel more comfortable with that thought process. So a couple of strategies that are coming to mind right now. So uh, actors need to be reminded to breathe. Yeah. You know, the word inspiration means both the having of, a, of an idea and also literal drawing in a breath. So those two things are, are connected even in does it begin with the breath? I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big believer in breath. From breath to sound to speech. Yes. And then the thing that even comes before the breath is the thought, is the idea or mm. the need to communicate that then inspires that breath. Amrita, 
So you are a, a multidisciplinary, I would call you a play doula, <laughs> right? You you shepherd you shepherd new plays into existence. You're part of that process. Mm-hmm. What is it in particular? Are, are there are there things that you're finding that playwrights have in common and what they're trying what what's what what, their places of preoccupation today now Uh, what immediately comes to mind which i see frequently and also very much excites me when i think of uh the writing of today is analysis and deconstruction of of form and style. I'm working with so many playwrights as well as also observing uh, which plays are, you know, finding their journey through different uh, theater circuits. And there's such a a beautiful engagement with really considering, you know, what are the forms that we've learned and what is the best form to tell my story and, and what are the ways in which a play can also reveal a playwright's point of view in, in a more direct way, um, which I think is, is a very experimental process. And I think in, in perhaps the interesting parallel that Shakespeare started his deeply experimental process during a plague, I'm seeing very experimental processes come out at this time. Uh, I also think that uh, there is, I'm finding, which I think is is really interesting, you know, there's many, many playwrights that are now working for television, that are being hired as TV writers or or creators or showrunners. And I I know some in, in the theater field that are very upset by that, very disappointed that our playwrights are going to TV. I personally love it because I love when writers are engaging with a different form and also earning a living for their writing. And I, I think that that is also shifting the makeup of storytelling as we know it. I think, you know, the I, I'm seeing more plays that are engaging with either, you know, traits that I often find in television that are, you know, long form episodic in, in their nature that are really looking at the centralization of character or situation as the drive, or I'm seeing plays that are that are kind of the opposite of that, you know, where, where writers are being fed by TV in that way and are then creating like these really epic theatrical theatrical can only be for the stage uh, types of plays. Uh, So there's, you know, there's a lot, Michael. There's a lot that's happening right now that I'm very excited about. Do you have a a sort of in a perfect world, theater is this in, say, 2030 or 2040 or by the end of your lifetime? What do you hope to see represented on stage? Yeah, I, I would love... You know, there's so many conversations that I'm seeing right now about how what's on stage, you know, the desire for what's on stage to get closer to the global majority representation and really speaking to the storytelling that is far more representative of populations that have often not been on the stage. And, And my dear hope my dear, dear hope, but I believe it will be true for 2030 and beyond, is that we'll see it more and as a result have to fight for it less, that it will actually be the truth of what we see on stage. Uh, I also would love to be able to see theater in the way in which I think Shakespeare was truly an experimentalist, theater that is just far more, you know, experimental in considering what is theater, what is performance, what does an audience need? Uh, You know, I'm seeing such exciting explorations around more participatory and immersive theater, uh, which I'm excited about. You know, what does it mean to kind of be, as an audience member, a direct participant in making the story happen um, or immersed into a new world that also involves one physically kind of traveling through different sets in different areas. Um, I'm seeing far more hybridity from from theater to film, which I think will continue, and I'm excited about that. And I'm also just seeing really deep, honest, truthful narratives. You know, a lot of uh, great great plays that are just holding accountability to how we look at our current moment and look at the past and imagine the future. So I hope, I hope that's all part of uh, what we see on stage moving forward. 
Is there anything, uh, Julian Amrita, about this production that you really appreciate or that that stayed with you uh, working on it or listening to it now that it's uh, out for the world? Julie? Uh, lots of things. Um, getting to work with a cast of, of female and non-binary actors is one of them. And, and, and also working on the language as meant only to be heard, it, you know, to consider the fact that we didn't have visual uh, communication, we didn't have staging to help tell the story. So really using the language as the primary storytelling um, mechanism was really, really challenging and meaningful. Um, and, and within that, working with the cast to find different voices for different characters, you know, several of the, most of the cast members were playing more than one um, character in the play. So finding those voices was really exciting. I'm thinking now about, you know, about the fact that women in ancient Rome were not in power. They didn't get to make decisions. They didn't get to participate in society. And so to hear this, um, this story told in their voices was really um, meant a lot to me. Great, thank you, Amrita. I would like to speak to this this phenomenal cast and and kind of the um, just how interesting I think it is, given in Shakespeare's time that we saw men portray all roles, including including women, that we get to see a cast of women and non-binary actors who are inhabiting a play that has often been so dominantly masculine in its production history, um, where women are truly the minority. I just think it's it's it was very meaningful to work on a on a production where um, women and non-binary folks were at the center of of bringing these roles to life and giving voice to them. Amrita Ramanan. Julie Fo, thank you so much for giving so much of your time and speaking to us with such eloquence and such incredible knowledge about Shakespeare's time, about ancient Rome, about our current time, about the craft of acting and using our voices uh, and writing. I cannot tell you how much all of us who will listen to this podcast will appreciate it and, and learn from what you've contributed. It's been great having you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. You've been listening to bonus content at Next Chapter Podcasts. You can learn more about us by going to ncpodcasts.com. That's N as in next, C as in chapter, podcasts with an S at the end, dot com. And from there, you can navigate to all kinds of different series that we're producing, including other play on podcasts and the bonus content that accompanies them from Macbeth to A Midsummer Night's Dream to Pericles and coming up next, King Lear. I look forward to talking to you there.